I'm Heather Marie Montilla. I'm Heather Marie Montilla and you're watching PBS Books. Tonight's event continues the spotlight on trailblazing women, which is especially crucial during our continued celebration of the 100 year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment during Women's History Month. Specifically, we are celebrating the life and work of a cultural icon and national treasure, Sonia Sanchez. This evening, we are joined by libraries in our network, which is more than 1,800 strong, and community partners across the country, connecting our national audience to important topics like this event. Especially this year, your local library was working tirelessly to share quality content with its communities. And we thank you for coming and, and being a participant with us. We are proud to have this event co-sponsored by ASALA, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, and honored to have their executive director with us today, Sylvia Cyrus. Sylvia? Good evening. The Association for the Study of African-American Life and History and PBS Books continues our partnership for Women's History Month as a part of the Trailblazing Women series. Sonia Sanchez comes from a long line and continues a long line of excellence among black female poets. Amanda Gorman, the 22 year old who gave a spellbinding spoken word performance at the Biden-Harris inauguration is a part of this tradition as are less familiar names such as Lucille Clifton, Frances Harper, Alice Dunbar Nelson, Margaret Walker, Audre Lorde, and Phyllis Wheatley. Likely you are more familiar with the names of such poets as Ntozaki Shainga, Gwendolyn Brooks, Mari Evans, Nikki Giovanni, Maya Angelou, Wanda Coleman, and Tracy K. Smith. Black female poets have served as U.S. Poet Laureates and Poet Laureates for several states. Their collections of poetry have won the Pulitzer Award and have been finalists for many industry awards. Their writings cross many subjects and genres, including joy, spirituality, race, racial inequality, womanhood, parenting, re relationships, the black female body, the black family, motherhood, poverty, and more. Black female poets simultaneously embrace the oral tradition of the black community and the tradition of the written word. Sonia Sanchez is a beloved member of ASALA and we are proud to co-sponsor this discussion. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Sylvia, and we are so once again honored to have uh, Asala as a true partner in this initiative. So Sonia Sanchez is a writer, a poet, a playwright, activist, and scholar. Let's take a moment to watch this clip. Sonia Sanchez was born in Birmingham, Alabama and grew up in Harlem, where she remained until well into her career. Attending Hunter College, she earned a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science before getting her postgraduate degree from NYU. Sonia remained in the city until 1967, when she began traveling to teach and lecture at more than 500 college campuses across the U.S. As a poet, playwright, activist, and teacher, Sonia's work has been driven by passion, and as such, it has garnered awards and recognition. Known for her influence in the Black Arts Movement, Sonia has helped lead the effort in establishing Black Studies education at the university level, where she's encountered audiences willing to carry on the tradition she calls the resistance in American literature. 
Much of her impact focuses on the rights of women, specifically black women, as she paves the way for younger generations. On the way going to the Great Wall of China, I wrote a haiku that said, let me wear the day well, so when it reaches you, you will enjoy it. I was greeting the day before my children greeted the day, yeah. and it was incumbent upon me to wear it well. Sonia has published at least seven plays and more than two dozen collections of poetry, short stories, essays, and children's books. Her poetic collection intertwines Black English with haiku and tanka, melded with blues rhythms. One of her most well-known publications, Shake Loose My Skin, is a testament to the literary and political powers that Sonia has carried with her throughout her life. You're watching PBS Books. Hope you learned a little bit more about Trailblazer Sonia Sanchez. Tonight, to guide our conversation, we're fortunate to have Tracy Hall. Tracy Hall is the executive director of the American Library Association. She is also a poet and is a Cave Canem Fellow. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. I am super excited. <laughs> well, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, please enjoy, and I will see you on the other side. Absolutely. Sonia, I am thrilled um, to be here. Of course, you and I had an opportunity to spend a little time together earlier today. And uh, I think everyone listening in has a treat in store. A conversation with uh, Sonia Sanchez is an illuminating thing, and we're going to get into it right now. Uh, Sonia, first of all, I just want to acknowledge uh, Sylvia and Asala. Um, Sylvia, you, Sonia, and I are connected in a different way. Um, also to uh, our vice president now, Kamala Harris. We're all uh, members of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, an African-American sorority founded in 19. Um, oh eight. So I want to just acknowledge the sisterhood there and the love there. I think that is uh, very, very significant. But I want to get into this book, this opus, Sonia Sanchez, uh, a new book released by Beacon Press that I, that I think um, for people who are discovering or rediscovering your work is essential. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? How did it came to be? And how did you select the poems that would represent your multi-decade career that we find in uh, Sonia Sanchez, the book? Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for that question. But you know, um, at the time when, they, when we were selecting the book um, uh, with, my, with my editor, um, uh, I, was, uh, I had a terrible concussion. And so I uh, worked a little bit, but they did most of the work uh, on this book, uh, choosing poems. They would ask me sometimes, you know, did you want this? Did you want that? Uh, Helen would call and she was very careful. But, you know, I was in a real struggle to get my head back in order at that particular point. So I was doing a lot of, lot of rest, uh, resting and, um, and sleeping also too. But um, uh, many of the poems, you know, came from the different books. I think at this time I've done what, 20 books. Uh, and so therefore uh, I would get a call and they would ask, did I want this poem in? Or, and I would select some of the poems and said, yes, I would. Um, but, you know, I, it was so interesting for me. Uh, sometimes when I was just resting, I would pick up uh, the manuscript they sent me and I would double over it with some of the poems that I had written when I was younger, right? Um, and some of the poems I wrote uh, in the midst of real struggle at San Francisco State when we started something called Black Studies in, in 1966. Um, and I remember that uh, as I read it to some of the students, um, 
uh, they, they said, we want to add this to that poem. We want to add that to this poem. It, it's not tough enough. It's not rough enough. But uh, they were amazing young women uh, at a place called San Francisco State College. And, and they were my first readers um, and listener twos to some of the poems that I was doing for a book called Homecoming. And they were also some of the first people. I, I was in San Francisco and a man by the name of Ed Bullens was out in California. And I got a call one night saying, you write plays, don't you, Sonia? And I said, without missing a beat, I tell all you young writers, always say yes. I said, yes, I do right place. Well, could you uh, get one of your plays to me tomorrow uh, over at the office? And lo and behold, I stayed up all night and wrote a play called Sister Sonji. Can you imagine? Right. And then I knocked on my students. My students lived over me in this house. And I said, I need for you to take this into the office, the BSU office, and I need for you to type it up. And that's how I did a play called Sister Sonji. Can you, I mean, when you think about it, you know, I could never do that now, but it's amazing when you're in a struggle and you're working and someone calls you. So I tell my students, when someone says, you do write uh, sonnets, you say, don't miss me. Oh yes, I write sonnets all the time. And you go pick up those old books from college, right? And look up those sonnets, whatever. And you sit down and write a sonnet because that way you get published. Louis Bogan, a famous writer, uh, in American literature, uh, who was my amazing teacher at NYU, uh, said that she had a dear friend and every year they had dinner together. And she said, you know what was interesting about her, uh, uh, Sonia Sanchez? I said, what? She, did a, she had a poem. And I said, oh, really? Oh, yes. She brought, every year she did one poem. And then she looked at me with her very straight eyes and, and her mouth, she says, and of course, you know, she'll never be a poet. You can't write one poem, you know, <laughs> and, you know, in one year and be a poet. I shall never forget that. And I thought, uh-huh, that's why you make us write a poem a week in this class. She was an amazing, amazing poet. Uh, and if you get a chance, read Louise Bogan. She wrote some beautiful poetry. Yeah. Then this is I'm Gonna Do Her Proud by um, asking you, uh, to read maybe a poem that just brings her to mind. We have to hear from you. So we'll start with a poem from you and then have other questions. Well, I'm not too sure of the haku, but it will on some levels. Um, uh, her poetry was very intricate and I was just uh, turning over. I mean, I have a, a number of intricate poems. I just didn't, I did not uh, mark them, but um, I, I held, I was gonna begin with uh, uh, a haku I did for Harriet Tubman. And, um, and uh, when I did this poem, I found out with the, with the sister who uh, did, uh, she did uh, uh, some beautiful, beautiful filming of the area that Harriet Tubman came from. And she put it together with, I narrated, I read the poem and, 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 and a, a fantastic musician, uh, Kristen McBride played his bass behind it. So it, you're talking about something really, very, really bad, you know? I got so from dealing and working with our dear brother that I thought for a while I could play that bass also too. Every now and then I go over and go boom, 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 boom. And he'd look at me, I said, I could do this, right? <laughs> right, but of course I can. But this is, uh, there's a, um, if you visit the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park and visit the center, you would see a sign that says, we are free because of Harriet Tubman. And I picked up on that. We are free because of Harriet Tubman, December 1850. Kasaya Foley, James Alfred Foley, six years old, Ara Menta baby, John Foley free. Early 1851, Moses Ross brother, unidentified man, unidentified man, late 1851, unidentified man called brother, unidentified wife of brother, unidentified, 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 fall 1852, unidentified, 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 
identified on I, identified on I, identified on I, identified on I, identified June 1854. Winnebar Johnson. We are free because of Harriet Tubman, October 1856, Tilly, November 1856, Hosea Bailey, William Bailey, Peter Pennington, Eliza Manarchy, May 1857, Harriet Green Ross, alias Harriet Rich Stewart, mother, Benjamin Ross, alias Benjamin Stewart, father, November, December 1860, Stephen Enos, Maria Enos, Harriet Enos, Amanda Enos, baby Enos, John Cornish, alias John Wesley Reed, unidentified woman, unknown dates, Margaret Stewart, and marie Stewart, unidentified twin girl, Amelia Hollis, alias Amelia Millie Hollis Stewart, Henry Carroll, unidentified twin girl. We're free because of Harriet Tubman, Christmas 1854, Robert Ross, alias John Stewart, brother, Henry Ross, alias William Henry Stewart, brother, Benjamin Ross, Jr., alias Jane Stewart, brother, Jane Kane, Peter Jackson, John Chase, unidentified, Unidentified, possibly William Thompson, unidentified, unidentified, early 1855, Harriet Ann Parker Ross, alias Harriet Ann Stewart, William Henry Ross, free son of William Ross, John Isaiah Ross, William Henry Ross, Henry Hooper, May 1856, May 1856, Ben Jackson, James Coleman, James Coleman, Henry Hopkins, Ben Jackson, William Conaway, AKA Cook, Tilly, 1856, 1856, Pennington, 1857, Harriet Green Ross, alias Harriet Rich Stewart, November, 1860, Stephen Ennels, Maria Ennels, Harriet Ennels, Amanda Ennels, Baby Ennels, unknown dates, Margaret Stewart, Anne Marie Stewart, unidentified twin girl, Amelia Hollis, Alias Amelia Millie Hollis Stewart, Henry Carroll, unidentified, 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 twin girl, girl, girl. Haku and Tonka for Harriet Tubman. Picture a woman riding thunder on the legs of slavery. Picture a woman walking southern landscapes, burning with moons. Picture her kissing our spines, saying no to the eyes of slavery. Picture her rotating the earth into a shape of lives becoming. Picture her leaning into the eyes of our birth clouds. Picture a woman moving in winter black, bringing summer moons. Picture this woman saying no to the constant yes of slavery. Picture a woman jumping rivers, her legs inhaling moons. Picture her right with seasons of legs running. Picture her tasting the secret corners of woods. Picture her saying, I have, you have, I have, you have within you the strength, the patience and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Imagine her words. Every great dream begins with a dream. Uh, imagine her saying, I freed a thousand slaves, could have freed a thousand more if they only knew they were slaves. Imagine her humming, how many days we got before we taste freedom. Imagine a woman say, asking how many workers for this freedom quilt Picture her saying, a live runaway could do great harm by going back, but a dead runaway could tell no secrets, could tell no secrets. <laughs> Picture the daylight bringing her to woods full of birth moons. Picture John Brown shaking her hands three times saying, General Tubman, General Tubman, General Tubman, picture her words. There's two things I got a right to, death or liberty. Picture her saying no to a play called Uncle Tom's Cabin. I am the real thing. Picture a black woman could not read or write trailing freedom refrains. Picture her face 
turning southward, walking down a southern road. Picture this woman, freedom bound, tasting a people's preserved breath. Picture her singing red moons, surprising life. Picture this woman of royalty wearing a crown of morning air. Picture her walking, running, reviving a country's breath. Picture her moon bent legs dancing inside freedom's guitar. Picture black voices leaving behind lost tongues. Picture her painting rainbows on a summer bent people. Picture a woman. I say picture a woman walking on freedom legs, a sea spray of life, a sea spray of life. That's haku I did for Sister Harriet Tubman. Hi. Oh my goodness, that poem, Sonia, um, I think reveals to everyone whether they are um, just catching up to your work or have been inspired by it over the decades, that poem, your delivery of it, the musicality of it, the painstaking research that you make seem so fluid and so organic there, that poem, that one poem demonstrates why you are one of the foremost voices of the Black arts movement. So I want to begin with the Black arts movement um, I, I want to begin, obviously, I'm a librarian, uh, you know, I, I work at the American Library Association, and you were published early in your career, Homecoming, the book that you just uh, referenced earlier in 1960, uh, We Are Bad People, Homecoming, bad. and We Are it Bad was, People. Bad. Hmm? No, it was bad in New York. It was bad, yes. Right in the library, right, yeah. Right, right, right. So, but talk about that for a minute. Talk about um, the Black Arts Movement and maybe uh, because this is Detroit, uh, uh, Broadside Press, which was based actually in, in Detroit, and Dudley Randall, who was um, considered to be, I think, um, one of the early fathers of the Black-owned press, um, at least contemporary. Can you talk about the Black Arts Movement, your relationship with Randall, with Detroit, and with other Black Arts Movement poets? Well, uh, the Black Arts Movement was, was coined that by uh, Brother Larry Neal, a poet, a playwright, um, um, I, I, and also not only a poet and a playwright, but he was also a musician I and mean, he did so much, uh, this man. And he coined that phrase uh, because you had a group of young writers who were insisting that they had a right to write about themselves, to talk about themselves, right? To bring to the people ideas about what it means really to be black and not the stuff that they got in movie houses and some of the books that we all read. And so there was this push uh, to talk about ourselves in what we call not spectacular terms, but in terms that spoke about our humanity. The purpose of the Black Arts Movement was to put the Black man, the Black woman and children and our art back on the world stage. We had been taken off the world stage and put in an enslavement period. And we said, we said in a very loud voice, you know, um, no, we are moving towards a world stage that will see us for all that we have done and all that we will do. And that caused, believe it or not, an uproar in a place called America. Uh, that part is, uh, is amazing when you think about it. And one of the things that helped us a great deal because, you know, a man by the name of Dudley Randall after uh, uh, Malcolm X was killed, you know, and the people who were very much the, 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 at the bottom uh, um, on the core of the Black Arts were two people, uh, Coltrane, right, and Malcolm. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and we were coming, moving on uh, the emphasis and, and, and what they were saying, what one was playing, saying, I'm going to move my music in, away from this Western, this Western construct, you know, to another, you know, to like a more basic thing with my, with my Africanness here showing, you know, with my music, with my jazz, I'm taking it someplace else. And then and Malcolm was saying, you know, do you want to, you know, uh, 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 go? the way of all flesh in a house that is burning because they're not taking care uh, of uh, the people who need to be taken care of, you know, in America, you know, and you're not really looking in no uncertain terms about, you know, what is going on 
what is going on, you know, with them, you know, in this particular country. Um, so here we are. Uh, the, the irony of all that is that the moment we are revving up, they both die. They both died. And all of a sudden we are here uh, uh, talking about what they have done, you know, uh, with the music, you know, uh, moving this into a, a different structure. Uh, we are talking about a man who is saying, you know, talking to black folks, you know, and saying simply, come on, do take over your neighborhoods, you know, write your books, write your music, you know, take over your schools, teach your children not to feel inferior and boom, they're both dead. And one of the people who came out to replace them was a man, man by the name of Leroy Jones, who said that he was in the village on the day that Malcolm was assassinated. And people came in and he said he determined to move out of the village within the next month and come to Harlem to begin and to continue uh, the great work that he did. And he sent letters to all the artists. You no, know, I got a letter, everyone got a letter. And this letter said, come to Harlem, come to this brownstone that we are buying in Harlem. Come and let us continue the work of Malcolm. You know, so we went around and saying, you know, we're the AM people after Malcolm <laughs> people um, moving on this earth. Uh, and 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 really bad, you know. Um, but it was in that place I like to do an aside of, about women, since this is Women's History Month into that place there on Harlem in that brownstone. One Sunday afternoon came a woman, you know, um, uh, who was a great jazz singer. Um, but don't tell me I'm gonna, I cannot be blanking on her name in the middle of, of television. But she, she sang with Max Roach. Uh, uh, you know, she was married to Max Roach. Um, Abby Lincoln. And Abby Lincoln, thank you. Woo. Um, Abby Lincoln would come with this amazing natural on her head and about 50 women strong were looking at her, right? And, and she began, she does a speech on who will revere the black woman. We had never heard anyone talk about anyone revering the black woman on any level, right? And we're sitting there transfixed, not only by her beauty, but by her words, by her intelligence, you know, um, you know, and and I just by how she sounded, that voice of hers, and how she looked, um, and so therefore uh, uh, they had programs like that. You know, we became very much involved with doing programs in that fashion, beginning to talk, you know, to uh, men and women about, you know. Uh, black women and what they were doing also on this earth. And, and, and this woman, Abby Lincoln, who will then do um, uh, an amazing uh, album uh, with Max Roach. Um, uh, and she begins the album with <laughs> the scream of black women enslaved. And that is why coming full circle, when you saw some of us writing, you know, I began to think, wow, I can sing too, you know, after you heard Abby Lincoln. And so I would like do this poem and go, <laughs> I mean, we were like, you know, we were like, uh, uh, it's very hard to explain the, the kind of people we were, but like, you know, we got up on stage and I remember saying in New York, I'm a black woman, someone booed. I said, yeah, you boo, cause you're not bright, you know, whatever. <laughs> But, you know, that's, you know, what we did. And we began, and the next time you said, I'm, and I'm a black woman, people jumped up and stamped their feet. I mean, you got to hear that. I mean, that amazing kind of thing that happened. We saw that happen within a year in a community. People like walking down. And I remember when I got a natural and I came to my father's house, I, I cooked a Sunday dinner for him, my sister and I, and I walked into the house and they said, my father, what did you do with that beautiful hair that you had? And I said, I got, no, I, I didn't say anything. I cooked the dinner, put it on the table for everyone and left. And I was so angry walking over to Lennox Avenue and I got to the corner. I did not have the light. It was um, a red light and then it turned green, but a taxi cab was just standing, just sitting there. And as I went across the street, he leaned out and said, ooga booga booga. I said, you too, you know, whatever, and kept walking. But that is the climate of the Black Arts Movement. You mm -hmm. can go to your community, you know, you know, you could open up stores in your community, right? You could do, you could uh, do home teaching, homeschooling in your community. You could take over the schools in your community. You could open up new schools in your community. You could teach your children. You could clean up your community. You didn't need people to come in and clean it up, you know. Uh, it was an amazing moment. 
opening up of bookstores, uh, schools, whatever, uh, uh, stores for people to come and shop, you know. And and there we were looking at each other saying simply, you know, you know, that we are not an enslaved people, you know, anymore, you know, and and call me a black woman, you know, do not call me a Negro anymore. It was an amazing period, an amazing moment in history. Yeah. So I want to ask you this question because of course we need to hear more from you. I would love to ask you to read another poem, but before I do, I just want to bring it forward. You know, people often describe the Black arts movement as if it were static. I think there there have been uh, several movements over time, and I just want to ask you where you see parallels in terms of today, in terms of contemporary poets, movements, arts collectives. What are you inspired by? Oh, the, I mean, the poets that came out of Kabakanum, right? Right. I mean, I see them. You know, I just read. I just read with uh, with one uh, uh, Jess. Tayamba. Tayamba Jess. Yeah, we read on a program. Uh, you know, uh, you know, virtual, of course, um, uh, up in Boston, uh, the bookstore up there in Boston. And when he read, I, I don't think he could see me, but I had tears in my eyes. See, whatever I see you all, I have tears in my eyes because this was the whole point. You see, the whole point of being a writer or being a cultural person or being in any kind of business or any kind of arts is not to hold on it for dear life. It is to make sure that you train and teach people coming behind. You will not be here forever, whatever. And so that's what I saw. I saw uh, uh, the students developing, you know, in Kabakanum. I saw them go out. I saw them actually, I, I see them on stage just reading. And I remember when I taught them, you know, I mean, I just, and I leaned back on my eyes, you know, and said, mm-hmm. And what that's about, we are not saying that people, we want people to repeat who we are, but we want them to have the ideas that we had, if you understand what I'm saying, you know, but don't just imitate us but have the ideas, you know, have the ideas that, you know, this poetry must speak about truth and about freedom. This poetry must begin to show people that they can walk upright as human beings. This poetry is about like, you know, let us at some point, you know, walk, walk and be the human beings. When, when um, uh, we were bombed in New York City, right? You know, the editors called me from newspapers and guess what they said, asked me, Professor Sanchez, what poems should we read to survive? Not play, not what's your story, what no novel, but what poem? And that's what I'm talking about, poetry. Poetry keeps us alive. It keeps us human. It says, what are you doing thinking that stupid thought, huh? Do you know you're a poet? You don't think stupid thoughts, right? You think thoughts that at some point would not only elevate you, but would elevate the world, that would keep the world human, that would keep these people with this obtuse, our ideas about you know racism and white supremacy, whatever, away from you know uh, young people's eyes and young people's throats and teeth, young people's bellies, whatever, etc. No, it would keep people from walking into a place where people are getting massages and killing people the way it happened in the place called Atlanta recently, you know. And one of the things I say to all the young poets and the poets and young people, if you teach. Have your children, have the children write notes, send cards, make cards to, and send it to those parlors, you know, to those places where people came in for relaxation to let them know that we are connected. We don't see an unjust thing. We don't see a killing and just keep on walking, you know. Uh, we go and we say simply, you know, you know, I am so sorry that people like that live on this earth, you know, but there are other people, you know, who don't act like that. They're, they, they try to move in this human spirit, you know, period. So we send much love and, 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 and respect to you. And if we can do anything, let us know. We have, we have to teach our children always to look up and talk about you know, what is wrong on this earth. Can I just say something else on that? When I was, um, I left um, uh, Philadelphia and I went down to a place called uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and I took a little plane to a place called Ushkut, Georgia. You know, it's a little place. I was gonna open up a conference. And when I got there, Philadelphia was burning. Move had happened. I called home and I said to my children, you'll be going to school tomorrow. You've got to, we've got to talk about what it means to be not correct, but what it means to be honorable 
what it means to be human. So when this discussion comes down, what we have to talk about, what side do we take? Do we take the side that you can drop bombs on people? And I reminded them that this had happened before in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, because you know, we taught this, whatever, but you know, whatever. And so they went, but I knew that they, I need to talk and talk to him the next night because I knew there would be all kinds of uproar, you know, in a classroom when they took the position that I don't care if you have locks, I don't care if you are making noise, whatever, nobody drops a bomb on uh, a population, a gentle population, you know, a population, a city, whatever, uh, that has been done once before, now now's the second time, and no one deserves that. So yes, you know, we, we, we talk and we teach. And because my children, uh, that the next night I called them and we cried together, you know, I should never forget that. And then I said, but you two were amazingly brave. You took the side that nobody else was gonna take because people can say, oh yeah, you know what happens. You know, you know they, they get up and make a lot of noise, but you make a lot of noise doesn't mean you, uh, you have a bomb dropped on you. And because of that, when I came home, I said to them, I had a, 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 a long uh, a reading trip um, uh, to um, Norway uh, where, um, uh, poets were coming, Baldwin was coming, all these people were coming to speak at that particular time. And I uh, said to my children, I hugged them and said, I'm so proud of you. You're going to go with your mama uh, to Norway, you know, as a trip, as payment, you know, for being moral. No one gets paid for being moral. Everyone gets paid for being immoral. You know what I'm saying? But right. it's, you know what I mean? But at some point, you know, hey, you know, you have, you have, the moral idea of what your mother goes out in the world to talk about. Uh, and this is so important, right? And so we went and they went. Anya, mm -hmm. I feel like um, there's so many questions that I have for you, but I feel like as you speak, you answer them and you answer them through your poetry. And before we go to questions, I wanna make sure that we hear from you one more time. I think we have about five minutes and I would hope that you could fill that time with, with poetry. We wanna hear from you. Should I do one to, to, um, to I should I do one to Max Roach or should I do the one that they, they had on, on HBO? Uh, on, on, on the ninth one when they were burning Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this just- I feel like Tulsa, you've invoked Tulsa. And I think to the degree that we have just talked about the tragedy that just occurred, the ways in which our spaces are violated, that spatial violation that is always attendant to white supremacy, it feels to me like Tulsa is really appropriate. Right, they, they um, I read this poem on the program when the bombing uh, uh, was happening um, Tulsa. I know I have the poem. I I I marked it in here so I could pick up the new book, right? And everyone <laughs> could see it. But now I'm not sure that that is really um, uh, the case that I really have it here. Um, but I do know. Oh, uh, I do know uh, where it is. This is amazing. You know, I got so involved with what I was talking about, and I think I dropped the. Um, I dropped the. Um, I dropped the. Um, here we go. Um, Catch the Fire, page 248. And you know, when uh, there's a sister who sings that the, the poem operatically, remember, did you see that section, that song? Um, and she sings the song uh, while the young woman, this young black woman was moving through the fire where they dropped the bomb on, on people in Tulsa, Oklahoma because they were rich and they, they, they had, you know, um, this place uh, this long place, you know, that was called uh, the Black, the Black, um, um, that's wild, the Black, uh, what's, what's up, you go to New York City, what is that, uh, the thing that all the money people go and ring the bell for, to, to show that, that it's a, it's a city that makes plenty of money, um, period, you know, it's, a, um, you know, you, you know, when you go, you know, people come into the country. Is it Wall Street, ticker tape? Gotcha. Thank you, it's Wall Street. <laughs> Catch the fire. Sometimes I don't know what to say to you now in the soft afternoon air while you hold us all in a single death. 
I say, where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? You got to find it and pass it on. You got to find it and pass it on from you to me, from me to her, from her to him, from the son to the father, from the brother to the sister, from the daughter to the mother, from the mother to the child. I say, where is your fire? Can't you smell it coming out of our past? The fire of living, not dying. The fire of loving, not killing. The fire of blackness, not gangster shadows. Where is our beautiful fire that gave light to the world? The fire of pyramids, the fire that burned through the holes of slave ships and made us breathe. The fire that made guts into chitlins. The fire that took rhythms and made jazz. The fire of sit-ins and marches that made us jump boundaries and barriers. The fire that took street talk and sounds and made righteous imhope tech raps. I say, where is your fire? The torch of life, full of Nzinga and Nat Turner and Garvey and Du Bois and Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin and Malcolm and Mandela. Sister, sister, brother, brother, come, come catch your fire. Don't kill. Hold your fire. Don't kill. Learn your fire. Don't kill. Be the fire. Don't kill. Catch the fire and burn with eyes that see our souls walking, singing, building, laughing, learning, loving, teaching, being, hey, brother, 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 hey, young sister, sister, here is my hand, catch, catch, catch the fire and live, 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 and that's the point um, that I read when they were, uh, one of the women was escaping and uh, she was co had come back in time and she was moving through the fire. And as she walked through the fire there on HBO uh, on that program that they did, you know, uh, you know, uh, it was just an amazing scene there. Uh, heart moving, you know, towards, you know, getting out of a place called Tulsa, you know, and, and, and becoming, you know, uh, not, not dead at that particular time, but uh, right. the fire. So they use that. And this woman who sang it operatically, wah, you know, um, you cried, you sat there and just cried because her voice was so clear and, and so beautiful. Uh, you know, and, and I, I think, think many of us are holding back tears right now. I have to say, I have to say, if, if someone is holding back tears, they're doing a, a good job. But Sonia, I want to open it up. I have one more question for you at sure. the end, but I do not want to be selfish. I want to invite Heather in. Um, there are some questions that I know are bubbling up. So Heather, if you can come on in and bring some of those questions into the round, we'll come back uh, uh, to this conversation, yours and mine, Sonia, a little later. Heather? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Our first question actually comes from Priyanka um, Gupta from the Girls Empowerment Network in Austin, Texas. Priyanka, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you so much, Heather. And hi, Sonia. Um, I almost to came to Austin to teach, believe it or not, many years ago, the university there at Austin, Texas. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you touched on this a little bit earlier, and I found it really illuminating. So I wanted to ask, how have current events, you know, social movements on a national or global scale, how have those impacted your journey as a writer, as a poet, and how has that sort of made your writing? Made my, your voice dropped. Made my writing what? Evolve. Evolve, right. Well, I, I think, my dear sister, that what is happening now, you know, happened before. What's so beautiful about the young people, you young people now, is that because of the media, right, you can get thousands and thousands of people out, and we didn't get that many people out. But the same ideas are, are there, right? And the ideas of, of uh, more freedom for people of color in this place called America and all people, you know. Uh, uh, so what we what we what we what we see today and what we saw also in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and to, on up to the 2000 on the people continued to talk about the freedom that has not really arrived in a place called America. You know, you talk about how people live. You talk about them not having uh, uh, the proper housing. You talk about them not having, you know, the proper medical care. Uh, we talk about them not having the proper schooling. When you look at the schooling, the schools in New York City, you know, they many of them are just as segregated as they were, you know, you know, in the early days.
when I went to school. So what we are talking about, my sister, is that you know, we are writing about this, we're struggling about this, we are hoping that young people understand that you know this idea of police brutality is nothing new. Right, that Audre Lord wrote a most amazing poem about the police breaking down the door in the Bronx and a grandmother was in the house and they killed her and dragged her out and she was not covered up. You know, you understand? I mean, people could see her parts, whatever. She was dragged out. And what is that about other than the utter disrespect? And they said, oops, we made a mistake. We're in the wrong apartment. But you can't bring people back to life when you make that mistake, when you come in in that fashion. Um, and so I remember you know, reading that poem out loud to my students. What I do know uh, that what we're asking uh, young people, you know, there's a saying that we're not asking young people, right? you know, to be like us. That's not the point. Uh, the women and the men and the young people, you know, from the 50s and the 40s and, and before. But we we're talking about, you know, we need for you to continue the ideas that we had, if you understand that. That's what this is about, you know, not to imitate and want to imitate what we, what we did, but also come, you know, with ideas uh, that are new, ideas that would take us to another, another level. Each generation, you know, or two must take us to another level. We can cannot stay at the same level. Uh, we cannot stay at the same level of police brutality that we have seen and marched about. We've got to understand that we must move to a different level, to a high level, to make sure that finally, at some particular point, this country understands that, you know, um, our bodies are not there to be beaten, uh, that people are not enslaved anymore. You cannot beat us. You cannot kill us in the streets anymore. And what we really expect for you to understand is that we must move and call uh, and call the police, call the mayors, call the police chiefs, call all the people that this is not to be allowed anymore. People of color must not be, must not be treated in this fashion. And other people also must not be treated in this fashion. So you began, you talk, you talk about strategies, you talk about how you, how you organize people, uh, you talk about uh, what they should do and must not do. Uh, you talk about when we went out, we were always trained, you know, that there was no violence involved in what, what we did. You understand that? Right, you know, so you didn't go, you know, uh, but when, if, if the violence did come, you know, you covered your head, um, you know, uh, you try to protect yourself. You get a big knot on your head that I cover uh, with, my, with my locks. Um, um, uh, but I couldn't get to an ice pack to make sure it went down. Um, the point is, my dear sister, that one of the things we try to do is we try to give information to people and we also let them make their own journey. We're not here to tell you what that journey is, we are, we, but we are here to say there's a problem here, there's a problem here, but you figure out your own walk towards your freedom. We will help in any way we can. We will come with information. We will come with all the things. We will come with people who can tell you how you do things, You know how you go in and negotiate uh, with police chiefs, how you go in and negotiate with a mayor, whatever, You know how you negotiate the streets of America, You know how you keep pushing people back, You know not in violence, with violence, uh, but with just the idea that these are freedom eyes walking towards you. These are freedom hands walking towards you. These are freedom feet walking towards you. Stand back. Stand back. There's no place for white supremacy for us, you know, for we, for us, for we, for us people of color walking towards you, for us white kids walking towards you, for all of us, the mothers now who join us walking towards you. We're talking about, you know, equality. Can you spell it? If you can't, we'll spell it for you, you know, because this is what we want, what we need. And this is why, you know, you try to train, uh, uh, train people. You give them books. You tell them, you know, what it is at some point. But then you say, but this is your battle, that you will fight this battle. You will go on. Um, you know, I have a poem. I want to stay on the battlefield till I die. I'm going to say on the battlefield till I die. I'm going to say on the battlefield. I'm going to say on the battlefield. I'm going to say on the battlefield till I die. That's what you do, is it not? And that's what we expect for many of the young people to do, to do the battlefield for freedom, because it is long overdue. Is it not, my dear sister? I hope I answered your question. You did. That's incredible. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Priyanka. Um, Sonia, I have a quick question. I know we have to wrap up, but okay. um, Natalie from New Jersey actually mm -hmm. asked if any of your poems have been translated into Spanish. And oh, yeah. Yeah. And where is the best place to get that? I don't know. A, a, a professor was doing it, right? But in, the, in some anthologies, uh, some of the poems are in there. Um, uh, and someone is supposed to be doing something now also to at this point. Uh, I'm hoping a book, a, a real a real live book. But on in some of the anthologies, they have Spanish and French and Arabic and um, um, uh, uh, what's, a, what's a major Chinese language? Um, Mandarin. Mandarin, right, yeah, which is fascinating, right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I know um, I've promised to actually hand the mic back to Tracy. Uh, Tracy has been a guiding voice of the conversation and we're so appreciative. Um, so I wanna hand it back to Tracy for any last comments or last words. Tracy. Okay. Tracy. Thank you so much, uh, Heather. Thank you all for the opportunity. I wanna definitely thank Detroit PBS um, for this opportunity and for this focus on Sonia Sanchez, um, which is so deserved. And my last question is for you, Sonia. You have um, over 20 books, poetry, plays, short stories, uh, children's books. What do you want to leave um, as part of your legacy to the next generation of writers? And of course, the librarian in me says readers as well. What do you want to leave? Oh, that's a hard question because that's like asking which one is your favorite child when you have you know, three or four children, right? But there's one book that I did that I thought was so important and wish every poet would read and that's Does Your House Have Lions? Uh, that's a poem written in Rhyme Royal. Um, you know, Lou, Louise Bogan taught us form and, and my students always say, oh, you're so hip. And then I, they would come to my class and I would teach them form. And then one would say, what? Form? You don't write in form. I said, I do uh, quite often, but something becomes so hard to write. Free verse will not support it, but form will, because I'm afraid it is so fragile what I'm talking about, right? That unless I have a form to form it, right? You know, it will not stand. So quite often I retreat to form. So Does Your House Have Lines is about my father and my brother um, and, and the family and almost the dissolution of the family when the brother comes north from Alabama, not to love his family, but to destroy his family. And it is about the, the sister's voice and the, and the brother's voice and the father's voice, right? And the motion and movement, and then bringing in the ancestors' voices, you know, who talk to us and, and, and wanting to know where are the, where are the things, you know, that, that have told the world that we, that we have been, that they have been here on this earth, that there are no, there are no things here in a place called America. But this is a poem that I did, you know, for my brother and for my father. And I had to, to rely on, I had to rely on um, um, uh, friends who spoke, you know, uh, 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 African languages, you know, in order to put it in, in there as I wanted to put you know, the English in. And, and it is in Rhyme Royal. And you know, as a poet, that Rhyme Royal will kick you in the dairy air. You know, there were many times I took the Rhyme Dictionary and I, threw it off the bed and turned off the light and said, I said out loud, enough of this, Sonia. Go back to free verse. This rhyme, royal A, B, A, B, B, C, C is killing you, whatever. And then five minutes later, I turn the light on and go pick up the rhyme and dictionary and bring it back yeah. in bed. And said, but I'm you so own it. You, that, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that, that particular book because I definitely think, obviously, Sonia Sanchez, which represents so much of your life's work, um, is is important and uh, I think a quintessential reader. But to your point, if there is ever a book of poetry that I would love to see a film treatment of, it is Does Your House Have Lions? And your reading of it is something not to be missed. So as we close, I'm gonna put in a plug for, for, for that book, for Sonia Sanchez and also Does Your House Have Lions? I wanna thank you, Sonia, for being a national treasure, for being a woman's history month. Uh, 
right? For being a woman's history month in, in the flesh and for being in the tradition of Sojourner and Harriet Tubman um, in, in using your poetry to, to get us free. I, I wanna thank you. And again, I wanna thank everyone, please. Can you call it woman history? Herstory woman month? history, that's right. A woman's <laughs> history month, that's right. right. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, my dear sister. I hope that I didn't take up too much time. I, oh my goodness. Questions, you know? Right. No. 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 You were amazing. This Isn't she great? Right? You know, oh, I tell you, it, it is so good seeing her again. Oh gosh, you brought back such memories of, of, of the time that we were all together as poets working together. Mm. Yes, I want to just make sure, Heather, as we go back to you, th the reason why this is doubly an honor is because um, I had the opportunity to take class with Sonia, um, and there were some, and she knows, there was a conversation um, between the two of us um, that was really life-changing for me, and, uh, and so it is my great honor to, 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 to just bask in her glow. Uh, thank you so much, Sonia, for who you are, and Heather. You Go ahead. They're life changing for you. When I speak to young poets, it's life changing for me. Do you understand that? I mean, you got to hear that. You know, there is this this exchange. Uh, you know that. You know, when I listen to you and I see what you're saying and where you're moving to, you also carry me with you. So there's nothing between us. And I thank you for carrying me with you, my dear sister. All your young poets. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you for sharing your powerful message, your words of wisdom and your artistry with us. I know that your words are helping actually many people to across the country to connect more. Um, it resonates and, and thank you for fighting the fight. It's a crucial fight and we all need to participate and, and we need more poets. <laughs> um, and Tracy, mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> Tracy, thank you so much for moderating the conversation and, and for being here. And from PBS Books, until next time, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Mm.